as always, I encourage you to take your Bible and follow along with the lesson of the hour we'll talk about today. And we're going to talk about a subject that we talked about last week. It's actually part two of the lesson we started last Sunday morning at this particular time. Our lesson is the appeal of false religion, part two. And I have a lot to say about this particular subject. And we know, I think at one time, the three lessons probably would not even cover some of the things we'll talk about today. And I hope to get through some of these things. But our lesson text is taken from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 10 through 12. Here where Paul says, And with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not love or did not receive the love of the truth, that they might be saved. For this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie, that all that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. And I tell you, those are sobering words to think about. Think about the fact that some, because they do not love the truth, sometimes it may be too simple for them, or it may be not exciting enough. And I think that's what the appeal many times is is that there are claims that people make. So I want to refer to them as the, the far-out claims of <coughs> false teachers. And you may have seen some or hear, heard some of these on the radio as you're driving by. A lot of times I'll watch some of these people just to see what they'll say. And I've studied some of the things that they've said for this lesson in particular. Think about what some of the people said back in the past. Like some of the Mormons' teachings. Joseph Smith's taught some things that are really what I would consider far out claims. First of all, he would say, this is one of the quotes that was said about him, says, I, actually says this particularly, I told the brethren that the Book of Mormon was the most correct of any book on earth and the keystone of our religion. And a man would get nearer to God by abiding by its precepts that, than by any other book. And I know they kind of go back and say, well, not the Bible, not the, the Word of God that we already have, the 66 books of the Old and New Testament combined. And they try to backtrack some of that. But I'll tell you, if it is, they might say most accurate, and that's another thing he says. The, the Mormon 8th article of faith says this. This is still something they look to today. So we believe the Bible to be the Word of God as far as it's translated correctly. We also believe the Book of Mormon is to be, the, is the, to be the word of God. And I want to tell you that if you look at this, if you examine the book of Mormon, I actually have one of those in my library downstairs. I've looked at it, I've, I've, and it doesn't read exactly like our Bible in a lot of ways. It's oftentimes very more of a history than anything as uh, far as doctrine is concerned. But if it was accurate to the word of God, then it missed some very, it made some very key errors. First of all, it has the church established in 147 B.C. according to Mosiah 18 verse 17 in the Book of Mormon. That's not in the Bible, of course, because that's from the Book of Mormon itself. The church that Jesus was going to establish was well before Jesus even came to the scene. And then Alma chapter 7 verse 10 from the Book of Mormon <coughs> says that Jesus was born at Jerusalem. And that directly contradicts what Micah chapter 5 verse 2 says about Jesus being born in Bethlehem, the city of David, and Matthew chapter 2 verse 1. Now how they try to get around this is to say, well, Bethlehem was just the suburbs of Jerusalem, and still that doesn't make sense. So basically there has some inaccuracies to it, as the woman woman does, because it's another testament. And I would also even say, it was invented by Joseph Smith himself. It was supposed to be given to him by the angel Moroni uh, through a top at a crystal ball and some gold plates. All, all that's involved in giving us the Book of Mormon, which is supposedly another testament that is binding on us today. And also another inaccuracy, when Jesus died on the cross, the Book of Mormon says there was darkness on the land for three days. Well, what does the Bible say? Well, in Matthew chapter 27, verse 45, it was not three days, but three hours of darkness. And so it, it is something we're going to follow today. It needs to be accurate. And it's not, and a lot of times it goes against the scripture. That's why we know that the Book of Mormon is not something we need to be following today. It's one of the far out claims that this is the word of God that we need to follow today. 
If you look at some of his teachings also, I don't have this on the charts, but they also believe that God was a man at one time upon another planet. And God had a father, and he's married to his goddess wife. You can look all this up and find this for yourself. That God has flesh and bones and can reproduce children just like you and I do. That Jesus and Satan were the first two spirit babies, as he as it referred to in Mormon doctrine, page 163 of their writings. And also, the, the Mormons teach you have the potential to become a god too. And so if you live uh, for, according to the teachings, you can become a god as well. And also, if you're married, if you want to stay married forever, just go to the temple and be married there, and you'll be married in heaven as well. Basically contradicting what Jesus says. But in heaven, there's neither marriage nor given in marriage, according to what Jesus would even tell us. And I believe Jesus knows more than Joseph Smith would know and the other who also teach those kind of things. We think about some of these sayings, though. Here's one of the most far out ones that you might find that Joseph Smith said. As far back as 1837, this is when I'm writing about this, says, I know that he, Joseph Smith, said the moon was inhabited by men and women the same as this earth, and that they lived to a greater age than we do, that they lived generally to near the age of a thousand years. He described the men as averaging nearly six feet in height and dressing quite uniformly in something near the Quaker style. I think the small quote of that was basically that he saw men on, on the moon six feet tall dressed as Quakers. And so, this is some of the far out things if we were to believe in Mormonism, which is not according to the word of God. It's not something that we ought to be listening to or think of anything of as far as religiously. But then there's other religious groups, Jehovah Witnesses teachings. Maybe you've had people come knock on your door because they're very zealous about door knocking and going trying to you know, recruit people into their kind of, of religion. Now, they have some false beliefs, if you will, especially when it comes to Jesus. This is one of their cardinal beliefs that Jesus is not equal to God in the sense that he's not God himself. He, they, they refer to him as a, a, a God rather than a lesser God, more of a demigod rather than Jesus, the Son of God. But the Bible says, tells us in John 1, verse 1, that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And that flatly contradicts what the Bible says there. Actually, in their New World Translation, they have to change that. They have to basically say, add the word A, God. The word A. Simply that one letter, A, on the last part of that, John 1, verse 1, completely changes the meaning. And so they basically want Jesus to not be with the Father in the sense of the same essence. You know, he was from the beginning. When the Bible says, let us make man in our image, he was referring to himself and the Father and the Holy Spirit as well. That's another thing that they often will say concerning the Holy Spirit, that he is an impersonal force. That's all the Holy Spirit is to Jehovah's Witnesses. And they look at it as God's impersonal force that he uses at his own will. And so they have a lot of doctrines based about that particular thing when it comes to that. One of the cardinal beliefs, another one of the cardinal beliefs, is that only 144,000 will go to heaven. And I think you look at Revelation chapter 14, some of the symbolic language there, they take that and say, well, this is literally, you know, oftentimes they'll pick and choose what's literal, what's figurative in the book of Revelation. And when you do that, you can have a lot of false teaching. You can have a lot of doctrines based upon taking things literally. Well, that's exactly what they do. When they take 12,000 out of each tribe in Revelation chapter 14, you'll find the number be 144,000. 12 times 12 is 144. And so to them, though, they look at that as that number is sealed. The rest of us, if we are, and I think they often will say that that number quite possibly has already been filled. The rest of us would have to have a place here on this earth. When they take the Lord's Supper, you know, it's not just for anyone. It's only for the people who think they're going to be a part of the 144,000. And they really don't know if that number's been sealed or not, but you know, they have the Lord's Supper offered, but very few people will show up to take it. Really contradicting what Paul would say about how we're all to remember the Lord's death till he comes. That's still in force until Jesus comes. We're all to partake of. Remember the death of our Lord. 
It's not just 144,000 does it, but all Christians today. And they believe they're following modern day prophets. You know, Charles Taz Russell, who was born in the mid 1800s. He lived about 1916 when he died. And he considered himself a modern day prophet to restore the church. He actually refers to that in that way, that he was a prophet of God. He refers to himself what Matthew 25 speaks about, that, that white, good and wise servant that gives bread to those. He considers himself that. And so they believe even today that their writings, when, it, when their writings in the Awake magazine and the Watchtower, all that, they believe they're inspired writings of prophets, modern day prophets today. But if they would, they would not have missed. You know, they have made a lot of predictions about Jesus' return. And they missed how many of these? 100%. It was predicted in 1878 that Jesus was going to return and restore all things and set up a kingdom. Well, that date came and went and no kingdom. Then in 1881, Charles Taz Russell revised that, said we missed it by a couple of years. And then in 1914, you wait a little while longer then, 1914 was the big date that really for them began the, the beginning of the end of the kingdom of men and was ushering in the kingdom of heaven. Well, they looked at the, the world war, particularly the first world war as a big sign of the end of all humanity's reign upon this earth. And so 1914 was a special date for many years with the Jehovah's Witnesses. But then when that day came and went, they switched over. Actually, it was the successor. Joseph Franklin Rutherford was the second president of the Jehovah's Witnesses. And he said it was 1918 that they needed to look for Jesus' return and take down all the kingdoms of men and establish his kingdom. Well, these predictions came and went. Again, 1918 came. And then the last one, this was actually more to our modern day, 1975, when I was five years old. That kind of gives you my age, doesn't it? When I was five years old when this one was, this date, 1975, well, what they decided was, we're not growing fast enough. We've got to make another date. Well, that's exactly what they did. And they actually lost a lot of people with these date settings. People were disillusioned that well, the things they were saying didn't come to pass and when they didn't come to pass, they would try to spin it and say, well, it, it, it didn't happen exactly the way we thought it would. Well, the problem is, when a prophet, we studied this last Sunday, or actually maybe the time of Sunday before that, about a prophet when he says something and it does not come to pass in Deuteronomy 18, you not to fear that prophet. That's exactly what these far out claims when people predict things like this. And really one of the big things about this was, they had so many times these failed predictions. And some I actually been saying there's more than that, up to 20 predictions. Well, in 1995, this is from a newspaper article. It says the Jehovah's Witnesses abandoned key tenet doctrine. Sect has quietly retreated from prediction that those alive in 1914 would see the end of the world. And so they basically said, we're not going to make any more predictions because they've been wrong so many times that they were losing followers. And they don't like to talk about these kind of things. You know, one thing, if you want to upset a Jehovah's Witness in some ways or get them not to talk to you, talk about some of these dates that they've set. And they'll not want to speak about that issue. Especially the one here. In 1929, Judge Rutherford decided, well, we're going to wait for all these patriarchs to come and they're going to be resurrected. And 1929, they decided to build a house for them. People like Moses and Joseph and all the patriarchs that mentioned in, in Hebrews chapter 11, those worthy ones. And so they're going to be resurrected, and we've got to have a place for them to live. So they bought this house. They built the house called Beth Serum, which actually refers to, uh, well, actually the, the translated as the house of princes. Well, what happened was, again, the dates came along and nobody was resurrected. No, you didn't have Moses living in this house. They actually even made the deed for them to hold the deed until Moses and men of the Old Testament come and start living in the house. Well, the problem was Judge Rutherford died in 1932, I believe it was. And later on, they sold the house in 1948. Again, they don't like to talk about these kind of things because it makes them to be false prophets. 
which they are false prophets. And that we have missed these, these, these claims that they're making are false, aren't they? Because when you, when you see something not come to pass, you know that they're not saying what is true and accurate with the Word of God. And then we talk about things like the rapture theory. And I actually want to bring a lesson. I'm going to talk about these things more thoroughly than I can in this particular hour. I have a lot to talk about this morning. But the rapture theory basically says the church is going to be snatched away. That's what the word rapture means, to be snatched away uh, very suddenly. And what they believe is like this bumper sticker. And there's a lot of it. I looked at a lot of these bumper stickers. It says, in case of rapture, this car will have no driver. Maybe you've seen these movies advertised, Left Behind. There's a whole series of movies that if you're in a plane and the pilot's a Christian and all of a sudden the rapture comes along, you're out of luck because that plane's going to crash because that man's raptured up out of the plane. He's called up suddenly. And if you don't have a, if his co-pilot is also a Christian supposedly, then he's also raptured Then the plane's going to crash. But I'll tell you, that scenario's not going to happen. They have the Dome of the Rock exploding, which is actually currently on Jerusalem. Because why? Because all these are premillennial ideas and doctrines. That Jerusalem has to be compassed about with armies once again. That Jerusalem, the temple will be destroyed. And they have to actually have it rebuilt. And then all these things happen based on their theory. But all this rapture theory, the Great Tribulation. And there's a lot of, actually, and I was looking at this lesson studying some of these things. There's a great debate on whether the rapture happens before the Great Tribulation or after the Great Tribulation. Now some say it happens before, some says it happens afterwards. Revelation 3 verse 10, here's where they get this idea. It says, because you have kept my command to persevere, I will also keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Now is Jesus talking to one of the churches, the local churches there, the churches of Asia. Now, he's talking about things which soon come to pass. As you look at Revelation chapter 1, that gives us oftentimes the context of a lot of things from the book of Revelation, especially these early things, he would say. Well, the tribulation, I believe, has come and went as far as the persecution of the church. And some are looking for something that's already happened. In a sense, uh, like Matthew 24, they say, well, that, there's the rapture. There's two in the field. One's taken, the other left. Well, that's not the context. The context of there is the destruction of Jerusalem. Jesus said not one stone be, be upon another here in Jerusalem after they were showing the great temple and everything. Well, they've talked about there how the day to make sure your flight is not in the winter. Be, and also those who are pregnant would have a hard time fleeing into the mountains. And so all that was, again, the context of the destruction of Jerusalem. Then there's speculations about the 666, the number of 666 of Revelation. In Revelation chapter 13, verses 16 to 18, the Bible says he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads that no one may, may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom that him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast. For it is the number of a man. His number is 666. Oftentimes, people take things literally, the figurative language here. And I believe in some ways Christians were persecuted. And they were having a hard time trying to buy and sell. Oftentimes because of their faith. Because of their allegiance to Christ. And I believe that's what that's referring to there time of persecution upon Christians there. And again, a lot of people want these far out claims to be true in a lot of ways. And then there's the mystery surrounding the Antichrist. Now a lot of people say, well I want to study the book of Revelation first. Oftentimes when you talk to somebody, a potential new convert to the, to the Lord Jesus Christ, we don't generally start the book of Revelation. There's a reason why for that. It's because the Antichrist, the beast, the false prophet, 666, and the Great Tribulation is not part of what we need to worry about first and foremost. You know, those are written for good reason. I believe written for those who were going through those kind of things. Those who were actually suffering for the name of Christ in the first century. And this idea that the Antichrist was actually a first century problem as well. 
In 1 John chapter 2, verse 18, here John tells us about the Antichrist. What does he say about the Antichrist? When he says, little children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come, by which we know that the is the last hour. 1 John 2, 22, he mentions it again. It says, who is the liar but the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, the one who denies the Father and the Son. And you get the idea sometimes that this Antichrist is more of a spirit of apostasy or denying what the Bible says rather than just a man himself, maybe personified in people who do those kind of things. But yet this Antichrist is those who oppose or against Jesus Christ and his doctrines. Notice what also says in 2 John 1 and verse 7. For many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. Now John had to write about these Gnostics who did not believe Jesus could come in the flesh because they considered all flesh evil. That's why Jesus could not come in the form of a body just like you and I today. But notice the last part says, this is the deceiver and the antichrist. Those who deny that. So in other words, in other words these, these Gnostics were part of this Antichrist movement, if you will. And so that all happened in the first century. But you know what happens when false claims that will undermine our faith, that will overthrow our faith even, if we're not careful. There were some in the first century. Paul would have to say to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 16 and 18, he says about shun profane and vain babblings for they will increase unto more ungodliness. And their word will eat as doth a canker, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection has passed already, and overthrow the faith of some. They were teaching things that were not biblical. Jesus taught a resurrection. Paul, in 1 Corinthians 15, spoke of the resurrection. But yet some would deny that. You might have to think, well, it might be some of the Sadducees who denied there was no resurrection. Well, whatever the case it was, people were saying these things were overthrowing the faith of some. And we still have a lot of things like that today, don't we? People are doing the same thing. Another appeal of false religion is this, is the all-inclusive nature <clears throat> of false religion. When people say, you know, I think we're all right in the same way, that all roads lead to heaven. I read this lady had put an article about that so, you know, eventually everybody's going to get to go to heaven. This idea of universalism is based upon the fact that all roads lead to heaven. This, we're just going different paths. We're all going to the same place. Well, I wish that were true, but we know the Bible teaches otherwise than that, that all roads do not lead to heaven. Especially in Matthew chapter 7, Jesus said there's a broad road that leads to destruction. So we know at least one is not leading to heaven. So that basically basically cancels out that whole theory that all roads lead to heaven. And basically, what they're teaching is a unity and diversity concept of denominationalism. Where you have, I, I, we have churches that are teaching several different things. I can say one thing, another church down the road says another thing, and that's, that's basically the way we are religiously divided today. They will have the, uh, basically the opposite views of what you and I will teach many times. They'll say, well, baptism has nothing to do with your salvation. The Lord's Supper will be taken any time you want to take it or, or just on certain occasions. There's a lot of things we are divided on, whether the role of women in the church. There's a lot of things. Israel music is another one of those things. Say, well, we all just need to get along and have unity in a diversity. Does Jesus teach unity and diversity? Does he teach that we all can believe different things and they're all right? Well, we know that. We're going to see it in a few moments. That's not true. There's what we call ecumenical movements. These world council of churches try to get people together. And basically what it is, is a conglomeration of people of different faiths. Saying we all are unified, even though we're divided. Doctrine. You know, we don't use that word ecumenical very much, do we? It's not our vocabulary very much. But it really basically, does, it, it describes, it's a big word that describes people if you put it in layman's terms, we are putting, we're basically putting a blind eye and turning our head against certain 
doctrines that we know are false, false teachings, if you will. We have to ignore those things. We basically have to say, well, we're all one. We'll ignore the fact that you don't teach and believe that baptism is for the remission of sins, which the Bible says it is. In Acts chapter 2, verse 38. There's a lot of movements say, well, let's just all get, to, get along despite our differences. And it's appeals to advocate toleration of other religions, doctrines, and beliefs. We're told we need to tolerate false teaching, false doctrine, things that go against the very words of Jesus. We're supposed to just simply ignore those things. Well, what happens to truth? What <clears throat> does that, what happens if we do that to truth? First of all, I want to suggest we have a compromised gospel if we do that. Paul didn't say in Galatians chapter 1 that we can teach the gospel of circumcision and also teach the gospel of baptism for the remission of sins. And all this be one and, and all this be good. Well, he said it would be compromised. It would actually be a perverted gospel. If we teach the Gentiles how to be circumcised and keep the law of Moses, Acts 15 would be meaningless because they debated that. You know what they said? They came to the conclusion that they were to bear no other burdens on the Gentiles than just simply not eating blood and, and things strangled and avoiding fornication. But as far as being circumcised, they didn't have to do that. Paul said we didn't do that. We didn't preach that they had to be circumcised. And if they had done that, they would preach a compromised gospel, as Galatians chapter 2 tells us. And that error is ignored. You know what you do if you, if you say, well, everybody's right, they has a right to their own belief. You basically say there's no such thing as error anymore. You know, there's no such thing as a false teacher, if that's the case. And so this all-inclusive nature of false religion is not true, is it? We simply can't have that because the Bible tells us what is the end result. The passage that we used last time in the beginning of our lesson, Romans 16, verse 17. Paul says, Now I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you learn and avoid them. You don't join them in an ecumenical movement. You don't say, Well, we're all right, you're all right, we're all right, let's all get on the boat together. We realize we have to avoid things like that and say it's false teaching. And the, really the big question is, if we were to do all the things men would want to do, <laughs> is God pleased? Matthew chapter 15. Was Jesus pleased with the traditions of the elders? He called them blind guides. They, they said, well, you're blind guides and the blind leave the blind. Both shall fall into the ditch. Is based on what Jesus said in verse 14. Verse 13 talks about how the every plant which my heavenly Father has not planted be uprooted. And, and he also said some of the most, you might say, strong words in verse 9. In vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrine the commandments of men. So God's not pleased when we compromise, have this all-inclusive nature of religion. Then there's the easier way of convenience. 1 Kings chapter 12. Did you know that Jeroboam teaches us this? The Bible says in verse 26, And Jeroboam said in his heart, Now the kingdom may return to the house of David if these people go up to offer sacrifices in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem. Then the heart of this people will turn back to the Lord, Rehoboam the king of Ju Judah, and they will kill me and go back to Rehoboam king of Judah. Therefore, the king asked advice made two calves of gold and said to the people, it is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Here are your gods, O Israel, which brought you up from the land of Egypt. They set up one in Bethel and the other put in Dan. Now this thing became a sin, for the people went to worship before the one as far as Dan. Now we did a lesson about this, this idea of the religion of Jeroboam. Well, it's a convenient religion. He wants the people to, to not have to go as far as all the way to Jerusalem. So it made it easier to stay home. Did you know that this appeals to a lot of people today? There's a saying we often say, less is more. Well, in religion, that's not true, is it? You know, there's a lot of things that we can be less on. We'll be less pleasing to God and Jesus Christ, if you will. There are people who want less commitment than what Jesus said in Matthew 16, verse 24, and verse 25. 
We talk about those who desire to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. So a lot of ways, less is not more. We need to have more commitment, not less. And some will say, well, less church attendance is better. Ignoring what the Bible says about forsaking, the assembling of ourselves together in Hebrews 11, verse 25. Now, I know the pandemic can change a lot of people's thinking about church. But a lot of people even say that if we keep these brick and mortar churches, we're going to die the death of the dinosaur. There were some actually people who said that. That if we keep having church the way it is, we don't get with the modern times, we're going to have really a less participation in church. But I will tell you, God's word still says the same thing for us to be together with one another. And some want less restrictions on my lifestyle, if you will. Some say, well, I can go to church and be a fornicator, be a, a homosexual. <laughs> or all the things the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, that the people of Corinth, they gave up these things. Paul said, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. So, you know, somebody said, well, can't I just live with my boyfriend before we get married? No, because that's fornication, or it's the appearance of fornication at, at the least. Now, we need to be very careful about our influence when it comes to that. And so we, some might say, I want less restriction. Well, the Bible has restrictions. We need to honor what Jesus has for our lives. And some say, well, I want less doctrine and more about love. There's some preachers who only want, only want to talk about love. But yet we still have to talk about the love of truth, if you will. Second John 9 tells us, whoever transgresses does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. And so we see we need doctrine. Don't we? If we go beyond that, oftentimes if we want less preaching about doctrine, that's when we get in trouble. Because as someone once said, what you're not preaching on is the next problem in the Lord's church. And I believe it because whatever we're not speaking about, whatever we're not talking in, in our discussions about, if we ignore instrumental music, and I believe some brethren have, Especially when it comes to our liberal brethren. They're paying the price of it because a lot of churches from the liberal churches have gone on to ultra-liberalism. Where they're experimenting once again with instrumental music and the roles of women in the church. Those are two, two, key, two key battlegrounds, if you will, when it comes to that. And I don't have time to say everything I want to say this morning. I just want to say this. I thought I would have enough time to get through this outline, but I just want to say this. The self-pleasing aspect of religious preference. When you build church your way, not God's way, we get it wrong every time, don't we? That's exactly what Jeroboam did in 1 Kings chapter 12. When he did all the things that he did, you read all the verse there, about making things the way he wanted it. And at Bethlehem installed the priest of the high places. He made them. So he made offerings on the altar which he had made at Bethel on the 15th day of the 8th month. In the month which he devised in his own heart. That's kind of a habit your way religion, isn't it? I believe that's exactly where we get the idea of join the church of your choice. Because you choose. It's all about your preferences. You go to a church that accepts what you already believe. That may be popular, but it's false. We need to find a church that suits our own preferences, have it your way type of religion. We have women and preachers as leaders, believes in signs and miracles today, and also wants the church more involved in social justice and politics and the social gospel. Maybe an entertainment such. I think I will go on because I have a very short point, this last point. The last appeal of false religion is this, is the appeal to emotions over Scripture. And this is one of the things the Bible teaches us. Colossians 3, verse 17, Whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. What did Peter say? He said, If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. What happens when we get emotions all in an uproar? 
So it doesn't matter what the Bible says. It's what we feel in our heart. Sometimes you hear the saying, better felt than told type of religion. Or things like this. that I wouldn't give a stack full of Bibles for what I feel in my heart. That's sometimes what's said. And then there's the idea of what the Mormons say. Just take the Book of Mormon. And then you just pray over it. And you'll get a burning in the bosom. That's what they call it. You get this emotional experience. That's how you know the Book of Mormon is true. Because of this emotional experience. Well, finally this. What's our reaction to such an appeal? We also know that Scripture doesn't matter. We have to have the right thinking. We also have the right to put our heart into what we're doing and avoid the extreme emotions. Thank you very much for your kind of attention to the lesson that I will now prepare for our Bible studies.